for uh, preparing our hearts to hear from your word, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would just anoint your word, Father, that you would speak through me, Father, to your people, that you continue to speak to me, Lord, as we go through this again, Lord. There is so much more in here uh, to grasp, Father, than, uh, uh, Lord, I know I have. And so, Father, I just pray, Lord, that you continue to speak to me as well. Go before this evening, Lord. I pray, Father, that you be glorified, Lord, that each one of us would go home walking a little closer with you, Father, uh, a little bit more of an understanding of just how much you love us, Father, and that relationship you've called us to. So, Father, go before this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's see. Second Corinthians. So, just a, a little recap. Um, Second Corinthians, this letter, it says Second Corinthians to us. It's probably about the fourth letter that Paul writes to this church. Uh, that started in Corinth. If you remember my little map, I didn't bring it again tonight, uh, but it, Corinth has a little peninsula on it, and that was an area where they would cut across from one ocean to the other to cut out going out into uh, the outer edge and getting caught in the storms, and so it was a safer bet to go across. I imagine they had ships on each side when they didn't have the canal, and they rolled their stuff or hauled their stuff and jumped in another ship. Makes sense to me, you know, have a car over there, have a car over here, and, uh, but it was that area, and Paul, uh, and along with Timothy and others, we'll see, uh, I think it's Sylvanus, uh, it helped to plant this church. They helped to share the gospel with this area, and then I explained just how wicked an area it was. See, Paul had spent a year and a half there, and shortly after leaving, he hears of the trouble that was plaguing the church. So he writes them a letter, and he sent it off. After looking at 1 Corinthians, we saw just how many things they struggled uh, with as a new church. With lots of outside pressures and attack, they also had that issue within the church. They, they needed help. And I pointed how uh, in between First and Second Corinthians, which we're going to get into again tonight, there was another letter, possibly even a visit. See, word had gotten back to Paul that it wasn't going good at all, which uh, he had written to them. He had written this other letter. It wasn't a good letter, but word had gotten back to Paul, and Paul refers to this letter that he writes in between these two as a sorrowful letter that he wrote with many tears, uh, weeping and writing things. Uh, it hurt him to do this. So you, you see Paul's heart. In Corinth, they had a saying about Paul. They said, oh, this man can write a great letter, but in person, he speaks very plainly. He, he, he puts it on the bottom shelf. He, he's not all that smart. And after the last letter, the sorrowful letter, you might not want to open your mail when you get it from Paul because he really can write up a storm. And upon opening the letter, you would see that it was a little bit different. See, in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, after hearing from Titus, that the church was doing better. They had heard from that last letter, and they were changing. The, the believers are dealing with the issues, and Paul writes in this letter that we need to be reaching out and encouraging one another. But there's another aspect to this comfort that maybe I overlooked last time. See, the comfort isn't just meant to be given to other believers. It's also meant to be given to the lost. See, all of us started off living our lives for ourselves with no concern for God. My life was no different. Maybe you gave your life to God early. I did not. Uh, the path that my life was on, it, it, I mean, if you carried it out to its end, it led to destruction. So many times in my life, I could share a story with you that the cops showed up. But what really changed my life was when Christ showed up. See, he had a plan the whole time. I have been where a lot of people are still today. I have done things I wish I never did. I have tried to drag others into the mess of my life. And I can honestly say beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is the one who changed my life. He is the one who can change your life. That is the hope that we have. See, the comfort I have been given, I have shared with others. I've told them some of my story. And Paul says, you know what? I killed people. I hated Christians. But Jesus changed my life, and he can change yours. 
See, because of the comfort we've been given, we can comfort other believers, that's true, but we can also comfort the lost in Christ. Now, this is how Paul starts his letter to them, and already it seems the tone of the letter has changed. Maybe this letter isn't going to come down on them so hard as the last ones had. In this letter, Paul isn't bringing the hammer out to drive home a lesson. Paul is actually revealing his heart to these guys. See, this is the most personal letter that Paul writes. I've shared that because of the problems and the letters Paul writes to Corinth that we know more about them than any other church in the Bible. Well, because of this letter, we also learn more personal details about Paul and his life than we learn from any other letter. He starts off reminding them of the grace and the peace they have with God the Father. And out of all the problems and the issues that were uh, being dealt with in the letters, the grace and the peace they have with God has not changed. You know, it's easy to look at ourselves and say, we're not worth it. And for them to read Paul's letters and say, man, we failed. But like Brad shared on Sunday, God sees us as very valuable. So valuable that he would sell everything, give up everything to purchase us failures and all. Warts, freckles, every bit of it. See, his offer of salvation, the grace he gives and the peace we have in God does not change just because we've blown it. Paul said that God comforts us in all our trials and that we need to comfort others with the same godly comfort we have been given. Build them up, come alongside them, encourage them in the Lord, just like you've been encouraged. See, this comfort we give has to be from a loving God and not from our own deceitful hearts. We can try to comfort people, but if it doesn't come from the Lord, then we're not doing any justice. We closed last week on verse 7, where Paul says that our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, so also you will partake of the consolation. See, Paul told us that suffering, because of our stand for Christ, is going to be a sure thing. What is also a sure thing is that just like God gave Paul and others the strength to endure the suffering and to stand in the trials, he will also give us the strength to endure. There's lots of times I need that strength in my life, and he gives it to me. I also pointed out that the comfort we receive increases as the trials also increase. He gives us enough. Maybe he gives us just enough that we would cry to him and then he gives us some more. I don't know, but we always have the right amount. And tonight we're going to pick it up in verse 8. So if you have your Bibles open, in verse 8 it says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. See, Paul shares with the believers the personal trials that he and others went through in Asia. He says, I, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be unaware of the trials and the troubles that we went through. See, he's sharing the very real struggles with them. And the result, as we will see, is that they started praying for Paul. What these trials uh, were, lots of people have speculated about. Maybe it was when the riot started in Ephesus with uh, the silversmith or the coppersmith or uh, he went through all kinds of different trials. But we don't know what the trials were. He doesn't write in this letter what they were, but they apparently did know. We only see how this burden made them feel. And you would think that with all the experience that Paul had with God, you know, Jesus speaking to him on the road to Damascus, an audible voice taken up to the third heaven, seeing things he couldn't even describe. He said, it would, not, it would not be right for me to even try. I wouldn't do it justice. He was spoken to him when he was in jail. The Lord came and comforted him. Uh, the Holy Spirit was moving. Prophecies were coming true. He raised the dead. Uh, you would think that Paul would be able to walk through the middle of a huge storm and not be affected. He wouldn't look to the, he would just walk. He, he, it wouldn't bother him. But here, Paul is broken and he struggles 
See, he is not immune to the feelings of despair because of his past experiences, because of, of the things that he's gone through. He, he's not the super saint. I imagine he's better. I imagine he turns to the Lord a whole lot sooner, but he still struggles. And just because you can walk real close to the Lord one week or like Paul speak personally to Jesus Christ does not mean that next week you won't be so pressed in on that you come to the end of your strength and despair even of life. I wish that were true. I imagine it's like laying on the ground and someone stacking weights on your chest, this burden that he was under to where they're stacked so high that you can handle no more of them. That's kind of the picture I get of this burden that he was under. See, I've, I've given a message up here. You know, I've, I've studied all week. I've done my best to be diligent. I've given a message from this podium. I've shared in this church. And then afterwards, I've driven myself home in tears. You know, it's not that we're immune to attack. We have to give ourselves to the Lord. We have to ask for his strength. We're brought to the end of ourselves just like Paul is. See, trouble comes against every one of us. You may think that the one walking closer to the Lord walks on water. He spends so much time in God's word, he is immune to the failures and feelings of being burdened beyond what you can handle. Yet that is not true. I was going to tell a little joke about Brad and say, maybe you think he walks on water. You know, he steps out of the boat and he's walking on the water until he takes that other foot up off the, off the side of the boat and we start sinking. You know, we are not immune. Peter sank. We all can fall to this. And it's a place that God uses in our lives to draw us closer to him, as you'll see here tonight. Um, I had some examples of Elijah he walked with the Lord. He heard God's voice, but yet Elijah ran for his life when Jezebel got up and said she was going to take him out. Peter, he wept bitterly over some girl saying, weren't you one of his disciples? Moses struck that rock and then he hit it again. You know, we come to those areas where we may run out of strength. See, the burden was too much to bear, and he thought this was going to be the end. And we all will suffer or come under huge burdens beyond what we can bear. But the emphasis is not on the trial. Look at what Paul says. He says, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. See, the emphasis when they came to the end of themselves was that they turned to God. They learned to trust in him. Basically, they had come to the end of their strength, the ability to endure. The pressure was so much, it was like they were about to give up and let it crush them. See, the phrase, the sentence of death, brings to mind the thought of a judge rendering a verdict. Paul says, we felt condemned. We felt condemned to die. Maybe they felt this was God's will for them. Maybe God's allowing this in our lives for some reason, I don't know, but maybe God has condemned us, I don't know. But what we do know is that Paul came to a point where he says, we didn't trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. See, if God allowed them to die, then it was his hand. It's his will. His will also to be able to raise them back to life if that's what he so desires. I like how the New Living Translation uh, translates this verse in first, or 2 Corinthians 9. It says, in fact, we expected to die, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. See, God allows believers to suffer. He allows it for our good. He's not the cause of our suffering, but he uses these things to grow us. It is his mercy that draws us to him. And 2 Corinthians 3, 5 says, it is not as if we are able by ourselves to do anything for which we might take the credit, but our power, our strength comes from God. He also said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, that he pleaded to the Lord to remove some thorn in his flesh. And God said to him, my grace is enough for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches and needs and persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
See, Paul saw that the burden he was under had one huge effect on them. It drove them to God. See, they were at the end of themselves and were completely dependent on him. Not that anyone wants these types of trials, but we all need to be utterly dependent on him. And I, uh, I had read this, and it, I thought it was very interesting. Uh, it's just this little short proverb. Uh, it says the Arabs have this proverb. It says, all sunshine makes a desert. And the point they're trying to make is that a life of prosperity does not drive you to the Lord. It dries you up in the Lord. It makes us think that we're able to handle life on our own. We wake up and we pray to the Lord and we go about our day, but if your child is in the hospital, you're going to wake up praying. You're going to continue to pray throughout the day. Off and on, you're going to pray. As something, when they cough, when, when something happens, you pray. See, it's in the times of pressing, when the burdens are piled on, that we see just how much we need God. Now, I have prayed often for my family that those in my family would be driven to the gutter, that they would come to the end of themselves and that they would cry out for God. See, I don't want them to suffer. I don't, I don't want them to hurt. Uh, I don't want anything bad to happen to them. But what I do want is that they would turn to the Lord. I want what's best for them. What is best for all of us is when we see our complete need for God when we come to the end of ourselves, not that anybody wants to be in the gutter, but we all need to have that strength that he gives. Now, Paul continues on describing this event in his life, and he says, we trusted, we learned to rely on God who raises the dead. He says in 10, who delivered us from so great a death. And he does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. See, Paul says, God delivered them. And if you asked him, how confident are you? How sure are you, Paul, that God was the one that did this? And I imagine he would say, I'm 100% sure. Because there was no other way. We had no strength in ourselves. Only God could do this. Not only that, but the outcome was that Paul had this unshakable confidence in the God, in, in his God. And here we have three different statements about being delivered by Paul. He said, he did deliver us from so great a death. He does deliver us and he will deliver us. See, God's work in our lives is a continual work, past, present, and future. Now, I can think of no greater death than the one Jesus came to save us from, eternal separation, eternal death, uh, uh, eternity in hell. You know, uh, I can't think of a greater death than that. But Paul spoke of the deliverance he experienced in this letter, and we know that he who started the work in us is going to be faithful to complete it in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So uh, he's sharing with us just how God has delivered him. Now, John Terry had told me once, I've not forgotten it, he said, to look at God's past faithfulnesses in my life as a down payment on the trials that I'm going through. You know, has God been faithful to you before? God has been faithful to you. Then remember that as you go through what you're going through now. See, he didn't leave you then and he won't leave you now and he won't leave you in the future. See, Paul, Paul's trials, uh, the, the trial, what he went through, even though it is not mentioned, is not the main point. See, God delivered him. God was with him. God comforted Paul, and he has this confidence that he didn't have before. He says in Romans uh, 38, and, and I might have shared this last week. I, I didn't go and look at it. It just is still speaking to me. It says, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, that is one of Paul's points here. And the other point, I believe, is in the next verse. It says, you also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. 
Now, in the way it's written, it's a, a bit of a mouthful, but Paul says he was also comforted, strengthened, knowing that they were praying for him. See, the word helping together in the, in the Vine's dictionary is three words, actually, which mean to serve, uh, to be with, and to work. See, through their prayers, they were helping Paul to shoulder the load. As they shared in the burden by praying for Paul, they're also going to be able to share in the praising of God for the blessing that God poured out on Paul. That's kind of the reason why I said, where have you seen answered prayer tonight? Praise reports are, are great, and I, and I believe we should be praising the Lord for all the things that he's done. But as I was going through this, it's like, where is God answering prayer for you? And I can look back in the past and see all kinds of prayers that he has answered, and he's still answering them today. Uh, prayer has the ability to do battle in a way that we don't even realize. It can dispatch angels to help someone in need. Prayer is not a want to, though. For us, we are commanded to pray. Philippians 4, 6 says, be anxious for nothing. Don't worry, don't be anxious. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Tell him about it. Pray about it. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus. See, prayer is powerful and it changes life. Just knowing someone is praying for you is a huge comfort. And up here in this podium, I've seen a young man share from this stage just how his pastor was praying for him and how it helped him go through some struggles that he had in his life. And when he died, he said he was going to miss that most of all. And I felt the same way, and so did a lot of you. But I want you to know that I'm praying for you. I've been praying for you. When you guys pop into my mind, I pray for you again. And not only that, but so does Brad, so does Paul. We are all comforted and strengthened knowing that someone is praying for us. And you are not alone. We are praying. We're lifting you up to the Lord. Paul was very comforted by the fact that they were praying for him. And just like we are called to pray for one another, when we see our prayers answered, we also should praise and thank the Lord. It's a, it's a key part to our prayer life is praising and thanking him. Psalms 50 says, call upon me in the day of trouble. And that song's been going through my head all day. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. He's gonna deliver us and we're gonna turn around and praise him and thank him for what he's done. See, when he answers prayer, it's important to do that, to give him the praise that he deserves. Now, our God is amazing, so we thank him for everything. We thank him for breath. We thank him for everything. All that we have is because of him. And prayer is also the only thing that I know of that Paul asked from these Corinthian believers for himself because it was that important to him. He says in verse 12, for our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. A bit of a mouthful, but in this next section here, Paul begins to defend himself against an accusation that was uh, brought up against him uh, that maybe Paul was trying to manipulate them. See, he had said that he was going to visit, but he never showed up. Perhaps they had worked hard at getting the support that, that they had intended to give to the poor believers in Jerusalem. They may have scrambled to make sure everything was in order, and then Paul doesn't show up. So the believers were skeptical of him, thinking that he was manipulating them. And he says, our boasting is this. And that word boasting can sound prideful. But the word means to rejoice or to glory in. The boast Paul has is in God and what he has done for him, not in himself. So he says, we rejoice in this, that our conscience is clear. We have manipulated no one. Our only goal is to bring glory to God, to share his word and the good news about Jesus Christ as simple as possible, not using any human wisdom, but the wisdom that comes from God alone. See, through his grace, 
we have shared the love of God with you just like we have in all the other churches and have lived before you, setting a godly example, even more, he says, towards you than all the other churches. See, they knew Paul. They had spent time, a year and a half, it says, with them. And in all of that time, they could not accuse Paul of taking advantage of a single person. But there were still people in the church who did accuse Paul of this, that he was using them for his own gain. And he writes later on in this, in this book, uh, 2 Corinthians in chapter 12, he says, you have made me act like a fool. You ought to be writing letters of condemnation, letters of approval, letters stating that I am who I am. And, and uh, like this, uh, this, oh, what do you do when you apply for, uh, it's a, uh, it's like an application kind of a thing that says who he is. Um, but he says, you ought to have been writing these letters of accommodation for me. I'm not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I'm nothing at all. And when I was with you, I certainly gave you proof that I'm an apostle. For I patiently did many signs and wonders and miracles among you. The only thing I failed to do, which I do in other churches, was to become a financial burden to you. He said, please forgive me this wrong. See, Paul is able to say to them, our conscience is clear. We've conducted ourselves before you in simplicity and godly sincerity. God knows. God judges the heart. God knows our intents, and we haven't done anything of the sort. He says in 13, for we're not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. Now I trust you will understand even to the end, as also you have understood us in part that we are your boast as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. See, in Paul's letters, the message he gave in person, even the brothers he sent to them to encourage them and strengthen them have all shared the same message. See, Paul does not change the word to benefit himself. There's also no hidden meanings in what he writes, but his desire is that they would understand, and he says that they do understand in part they understand a little, but there's so much more room to grow. And I was looking at that and I was thinking, you know, it's okay that you don't understand it all. Because we know as we keep our eyes on the Lord that he's going to teach us. If we continue getting into his word, we're going to grow. We, we plug into fellowship. We do those things he's called us to do and we will grow. It's okay that we don't know all the answers. It's God's responsibility to teach us. We just have to be faithful to do the things he's called us to do. See, Paul says, you are our boast in God. We have shared his word and you've received it. God has blessed both of us and we can praise God for this. He says in verse 15, and in this confidence, I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit to pass by way of you to Macedonia and then to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Paul, like we read at the end of uh, 1 Corinthians, intended to come to these guys. He wrote out his itinerary. He, he wrote out his, his list, right? He sent it in a letter to them of his plans so that they knew his heart. He wanted to stay in fellowship with the believers there. And he even hoped to spend the winter. He said, I'm going to go to Macedonia and on my way, I'm going to stop by and visit real quick. And then on my way back, I hope to stay a while. But what apparently happened is either he received word of some issue in the church that needed to be addressed right away or on his way through Macedonia and he visited that one little quick trip, it didn't go so well. And so he planned on canceling his return trip uh, and that long stay with them, feeling it wasn't the Lord's will and it wouldn't do them any good if he stopped and stayed. You know, the tensions were high. I don't know. But he felt that the Lord was saying, don't go back. And so he didn't. So instead, Paul sent that letter, which he called the sorrowful letter with many tears. In verse 17, it says, therefore, when I was planning this, when I made these plans, do you think I did it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh that with me there should be a yes, yes, and a no, no? Do you think I'm like some people who just say, oh yeah, I will do that, when they really mean, no, I'm not going to do that. I, I'm just trying to push them off. See, Paul says, or do you think I make my plans according to my own will? 
See, Paul's point is, my desire in all of my plans is to do God's will. Whether that is to go to you and spend the winter or pass on by and write a letter instead, my desire in all of this is what does the Lord want? I told you what I wanted, but his desire is the most important to me. And that is why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 16, 7, maybe you remember it, for I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits, if it's God's will, if that's what he would have for me. We make our plans, but we ask the Lord to guide and direct our steps. In verse 18, he says, but as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. Now, Paul does not bounce back and forth between yes and no. As God is faithful, Paul says, Paul is being faithful to the direction of the Lord. God doesn't bounce back and forth between yes and no. And Paul's not bouncing back and forth. He is just being faithful to whatever the Lord guides and directs him to do. He says in verse 19, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. Now, just like the message of salvation in Jesus is not a wishy-washy, you know, you might be saved, you might not, it depends on how well you ask. The ones who are bringing the message have not been wishy-washy either. How can Paul say, follow me as I follow Christ, if he's untrustworthy, if he's a liar? If you can't trust the messenger, how can you trust the message that they bring? And Paul is not making his own decisions in this matter. He is completely sold to Christ and serves him. If the schedule changes, it is because God wanted it changed, not Paul. And for all the promises, in verse 20, he says of God, in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. See, this is an amazing verse. All the promises of God are in him. They are not only in Christ, but they are just as dependable in Christ as they are in God. We know God cannot lie. Jesus also cannot lie. God keeps all his promises, and so does Jesus. Numbers 23 says, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? See, this verse in Corinthians says the same thing about God and Jesus keeping their promises. In him are the promises. In him is the yes and the amen. And I'm going to close with these last two verses. It says, now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. You guys who know me, you already know what I'm going to say. I love it when God's word gives us a guarantee. I love a good promise. I love it when it says that. See, here's a promise, but what is it saying? What does it mean? See, he who establishes us or calls us to this wonderful relationship with God through Christ is God himself. He has also placed us in the ministry, placed his seal on us, giving us his spirit as a down payment, as another promise of more to come. Now, I really wanted to finish the chapter, but I think we're going to stop right here. We're going to have to leave off right here because of time. Because uh, as I was going through this, I was looking at it going, I can't make it to the end. But I thought this is a great place to stop. You know, I also think it's going to be a great place to start. You know, and the next time we get together, I get to start at this verse again. I get to look at the guarantee of God and dig in a little bit more for the next study. But how important is it to you that God has called you into a relationship with him? How important is that? How valuable? How much would you pay for that? See, the picture this verse gives is that of God working in your life. And the one who cannot lie and keeps his promises, he is the one who makes sure this promise will never fail. He is the insurance policy. He's the guarantee. This relationship is guaranteed by God himself. And then he anoints us. 
I'm reminded of when the priests have the oil poured on them. The items in the temple, the furniture, they're sprinkled with the oil, making them holy and set apart for God's use. Anoint means to smear or to rub oil on. That's a picture for you. See, God has anointed us in Christ. He has also sealed us. He's put his mark on us, showing that we belong to him. And then he also gives us the spirit as a guarantee blessing on top of blessing on top of blessing. See, the promise that we are his is a sure thing. It's a guarantee. And the one who's backing that guarantee is God himself, who cannot lie, who keeps every single promise he's ever made. And if you don't have this confidence that you belong to him, it all starts by realizing that you've sinned. Your life is not pleasing to God when you're living that sinful life. It says that God hates sin, and he has to punish it. So he sent his son that whoever would believe in Jesus Christ would not have to go to hell. They wouldn't have to suffer the consequences for their sin. He sent his son so that they can be forgiven because Jesus Christ took your punishment Jesus Christ doesn't cancel your punishment. He doesn't say that you don't deserve the punishment any longer. He says, I'll take it for you because you do deserve it. But he says, I'll take it. That way you don't have to suffer the punishment. See, if you will give your life to Jesus and trust in him, then these promises, this guarantee belongs to you. God makes this promise to you. But it all starts with faith in his son. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word tonight, Lord. I, I thank you for a guarantee. I thank you for your promises in your word, Lord. I thank you that you comfort us, Lord, and that that comfort increases as we go through different things, Lord. I thank you, Father, that we could pile weights on, Lord, and that you would help us through the prayers of our family, Father. I thank you, Lord, that you give us the spirit as a guarantee, the down payment, the promise of more to come. We've already been blessed so much, Lord, and you give us that promise of more to come. How amazing you are, Lord. How wonderful, how, how, how magnificent you are, Lord, and, and what a wonder it is that you would love people like us. All we can say is thank you. Thank you, Father, for your son, Lord. If there are people who are watching online, people here who don't know you, Father, I pray you touch their hearts, Lord. Help them to realize that every single one of us has this sin issue. And every single one of us deserves death. But your son has stepped in and taken his, this sin on himself so that everyone who believes in him would have eternal life. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that you touch hearts. Help people to make that commitment today, Lord. We ask, Father, that you continue to go before us, that you'd continue to help us to meditate on your word, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.